All right, welcome back. Mind Games on the air on the Sellout Crowd Network. Garen Emig, Sellout Crowd columnist and host of the show. Thanking you very much for watching and listening. Certainly thank you for reading my content and that of my colleagues at Sellout Crowd on selloutcrowd.com. We've loaded you back up with a lot of Sooners and Cowboys. And now that we're getting close to basketball season, Oklahoma City Thunder content, we appreciate you reading. We don't take that for granted. We hope you keep doing so. And we invite you to uh, download and like, subscribe to any and all of our shows, our podcasts, courtesy of all of your uh, your platforms that you're familiar with. We'll go over those toward the end of the program. Let's get right into it, though, with uh, a special guest, Antonio Morales, who covers USC for The Athletic. You, you probably have heard, uh, Antonio, but there is some attention paid here in Oklahoma as to how the Trojans are playing football because of the head coach and the quarterback and the defensive coordinator. and how all of that uh, transitioned from OU to USC a couple of years ago. Um, this was, believe it or not, on my checklist of things to do at, at some point this season. I, I did, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, shooting fish in a barrel hill and having you on because they just lost to Notre Dame, I promise. But I, I did want to uh, start. Well, first, let's start here. How long have you covered the team? Tell the, the viewers, listeners a little bit about your history with SC and, and what makes you the right guy to talk about what's going on with the Trojans. Yes, I've covered them since 2018. That was the year they were coming off a Rose Bowl in 2016 and a Pac-12 title in 2017. So that was a JT Daniels, Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, Tal Nohu Funga class. I was like really highly touted. I think they finished like number four in the country. So like I come onto the beat and you think uh, this is going to be like the class that kind of defines your time on the beat or whatever. And like this right. is going to be the class that takes them to the playoff or something. And uh, they go five and seven that year. Um, <laughs> uh, the next year, JT Daniels isn't even the starter. It's Keaton Slovis, who Oklahoma will probably have to play later this season. Yeah. Uh, and they have a, a ton of talent the next year, and they go eight and five. Uh, in 2020 COVID year, they go five and one, make the Pac-12 title game. But it was a, a weird year in the Pac-12. 2021, it's like four, four and eight, and Clay Helton gets fired, and you're wondering who's – going to be the coach and everyone thinks Dave Aranda or Matt Campbell or Luke Fickle and nobody really has Lincoln Riley right on the, on the radar um so that kind of is just a stunning move um which is one nobody really expected obviously um so yeah I've been, been around the program for a long time and covered the past season and a half uh with Lincoln Riley here and uh it's been interesting for sure I think um USC really wasn't relevant in the national conversation for the first four years. And then all, all of a sudden that changes within a day, a couple, yeah. within a couple of hours. Um, and they've been on, on a big platform and on a big stage for the past year and a half. So it's, it's been different to see how everything's gone. Yeah. It's, that's good and bad, right? That you, I can, we can relate in Oklahoma. That's, that's a fun, that's a fun beat to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, <laughs> it can also take a few years off your life if, if you're not yeah. careful with coach searches and drama and mm -hmm. uh, knowing that every every last morsel of information is going to be devoured. You also got a Heisman Trophy out of it, a trip to, yeah. New, trip to New York, I take it. So that that might have been cool. Yeah. Um, but now you've got a football team that dude, your most recent piece really got my attention. Uh, coming out of the loss in South Bend on Saturday, you wrote about a team that is, doesn't have an identity. And that, that that gets to a lot of things that OU fans are familiar with. It, it obviously starts with Lincoln Riley, the head coach, trickles down to Caleb Williams, the quarterback, maybe even Mario Williams, the former Sooner receivers in there somewhere. Obviously, Alex Grinch, the defensive coordinator, and some staff members who were here before Grinch took off for uh, for LA two years ago. Uh, is that is that about as well as you? Is that does that encapsulate what's going on coming out of Notre Dame as as anything in your mind? it's an identity crisis at this point. I just think they're, there's nothing they can really hang their hat on right now. Last year, Caleb was tremendous. And Caleb's been tremendous this year. The mm -hmm. Notre Dame game was his worst and one of the few bad games he's had at USC. But last year you knew, okay, they're going to run the ball and they can run the ball on pretty much anyone. And they were going to have Caleb Williams making plays in the passing game too. Um, so they could do whatever they wanted offensively last year. And you knew the defense was going to be bad. And the special teams are going to be whatever. There isn't much attention to detail there. I'm sure Oklahoma fans saw that with the, no special teams coach and stuff like that. Right. But, um, right. Um, and this year, the, like they don't really like the offensive line took um, a step backward, and I think 
that was one of the narratives last year that I think a lot of people who didn't pay attention to USC in 2021, like when Caleb went there, you just said, you just, like a lot of people just said like, oh, who's going to block for him? Mm-hmm. But he, he actually had a good off the line. Like well, USC had a good line in 2021 and they brought back like everyone from that line in 2022. And I think that, that was one of the more underrated things this off season, the more like under the radar things was they lost their all American left guard, Andrew Voorhees. They lost their center, uh, all Pac-12 center and Brett Nealon. They lost their starting left tackle. Um, and that was a group that had played together for like three years, three or four years in and put so much time together. And they were an yeah. older group and an older and experienced group goes, goes a long way in college football. And, uh, this year, they brought in three transfers who are all highly touted. Um, mm-hmm. a guy from Washington State, a guy from Florida, another one from Wyoming. And everyone just assumed, like, oh, the offensive line's been better because these guys were highly touted transfers. And that hasn't been the case. And I think if you're looking for the difference between this year's team and last year's team, that's kind of where it starts because they can't run the ball as well as last year. They aren't protecting Caleb as well as they were last year. And uh, I think it all just starts from there. I know the defense gets the headlines for being bad right. and not being good, but – I think first, everyone kind of expected, like, okay, this defense isn't going to be great. I think people had expectations this offense was going to be great. And the past last week, it wasn't. And the week before, it's had issues too. So it's, it showed signs of, you know, some cracks. Yeah. Well, that brings me to a question, a follow up. And this was part of your column. Your story was what, how did you phrase it? That this is a team that kind of was sticking its chin out, waiting, waiting yeah. for someone to punch it, right? I mean, it, you. You wrote as if you saw this coming. What I don't know if you saw forty eight twenty coming, but you saw a loss coming, uh, perhaps as early as South Bend. Did you get a sense that a lot of folks attached to the program or, or who followed the program did as well? I think they thought a loss was coming. I don't know if they thought like forty eight twenty in, in yeah. my mind. Just the, the habits they were showing was it was when this team loses eventually it's it wasn't going to lose pretty it was gonna, it was going to be an ugly loss whenever they suffered it it was going to be utah notre dame oregon washington um just because they had shown some kind of bad habits throughout the previous three games whether it was yeah. being in a dog fight with arizona state in the fourth quarter a one possession game when you're a 34 point favorite or having a 27 point lead against colorado and then needing an onside kick to right to close that one out or uh, going to three overtimes with Arizona. I think Arizona is better this year. Uh, they're improved. Uh, we saw what they did to Washington state last week, but I mean, three overtimes is, you know, a lot for USC to ask for. I think they're a 21 point favorite in that game. Uh-huh. Um, so um, you saw the troubling signs the, the three weeks before that. And, uh, you know, you just knew they were playing with fire. One game they're going to get burned. It might be more than one game just because of the habits, They've shown, and I know the fans tend to do like, well, you know, have reasons for why these mm-hmm. things are happening. But uh, through the first six games, and Notre Dame was the seventh. Through the first six games, it was just like through six games, you kind of know who you are, and mm-hmm. you don't you don't just like flip a switch uh, um, when the competition gets tougher. And that was supposed to be the soft the soft part of the schedule. Yeah, and, and, and Notre Dame was going to be the kickoff of a, a really difficult second half where five of the six teams they play are ranked and uh, they didn't show good signs against the soft part. So it was just like, what's going to happen when this thing gets more difficult. Well, you referenced it just now what's waiting for this team, right? And this, this is not a year where you want to show weakness in the pac 12. You might've gotten away. You might've gotten away with it. A lot of the more recent years, but this season with the way Oregon looks and the Washington looks and, you know, we'll see about rising in, you know, Utah, but obviously Whittingham knows what he's doing defensively and they've been trouble for USC in the past. That's who the Trojans have to rebound against this weekend. UCLA rivalry game, you know how that can get weird. Uh, this, I mean, if it's Oklahoma, uh, you know, anytime the Sooners lose, no matter what the situation, uh, people are in the street. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if it's that way out in S, you know, in, in LA with everything else going on sports wise for for people in your neck of the woods to to, to glob onto. But do you do you get us? Is there any in any fringe base of of, of the fans or, or your your beat or the media that starts to worry just based on one loss that this this could really go sideways quickly? Yeah, I think if you see social media or, or in the comment section or on the message boards, I think yeah. that kind of, kind of started. 
a little bit after ASU, then Colorado was like, oh my gosh, like this defense is uh, bad and like not any different than it was last year. And then um, the Arizona game, I think for the fan base, I think that was a wake up call just because they were down 17 nothing. Like I said, mm-hmm. it took three overtimes. And then uh, obviously the loss to Notre Dame, I think that really you know, set everything you know, into a, you know, the fan base into an anxious mode just because mm-hmm. it's a rival. It's a rival on the big stage. You're on prime time. It was the first real big game you had this year, and you got embarrassed. You lost by four touchdowns. And even when they lost last year, for the most part, it was Utah was a one-point loss. Mm-hmm. Tulane was a one-point loss. Things kind of, kind of got away from them in the Pac-12 title game, but Caleb was hurt. They weren't really, like, physically, like, dominated in a way – like they were at Notre Dame on Saturday. So yeah. um, and this is year two when expectations were higher. Um, I think if this would have happened year one, maybe people would have been like, okay, it's year one, took over a, a bad roster, right. things like that. But this is year two when you know, they were 11-1 and one to start last year and you know, everyone has their expectations up now. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think, I think that was the troubling thing for the fans and that's what's kind of got them anxious or upset or angry right now. Yeah, well, and if you want to take a longer view, and you touched on this uh, toward toward the end of your column, there's a uh, there's a pipeline that has been established between USC and the the high profile program at Mater Dei, right mm-hmm. out there in California, and they have a number of you know A list prospects that would appear ready to to help someone, ready to help a program as early as as next next season, and you you wrote that USC. Has gone over with with modern day. Is that right? Yeah, modern day. They're over five. Modern day. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they've gone over five so far. Um, on the top 150, there's five top 150 kids at modern day. Um, this recruiting cycle, and they've all committed elsewhere. I think uh, one's committed to Alabama. One of the offensive linemen is committed to Texas. Another's committed to Auburn. Um, a corner's committed to Alabama. Uh, running backs committed to Georgia, and then one of their defensive linemen just committed to Oregon. So it's kind of spread out. And those are the SEC and Oregon have kind of been, even before Lincoln got here, Mm -hmm. the SEC and Oregon has kind of been the thorn and USC side when it comes to local recruiting. And Lincoln had success here too. And he had Malachi Nelson, Malik Brown, Makai Lemon, those guys committed. Sure. Um, But yeah, recruiting, it's been good. It's not like it's been terrible. I think they finished number eight last year in the country, but, um, they're number 18 right now, and it, it's, just, it's just the things that you might hear from a recruiting perspective in terms of, okay, well, maybe they need to see USC win first, and then the next class will be good. But USC won last year, and they had a tremendous first year under Lincoln Riley, and then um, this recruiting class still hasn't seen carried over that momentum. Like yeah. That momentum didn't carry over to the recruiting trail this year. And uh, I, I think there's... 37 blue chip prospects in California this year. And I think USC only has commitments from four of them. Um, so that's, mm. I, I know Lincoln wants to recruit nationally and make that a national brand, but um, I know there's battles they'd want to win in Southern California that they haven't won. And um, he's going to need more of that just because they're going to need better defensive players. Um, yeah. And I think even though this recruiting class is good, the, the average player rating is good, but you don't see enough demons alignment or linebackers, which has been obviously the weakness of the program for a few years now. I want to pivot Antonio to, uh, to Lincoln Riley himself. Uh, and again, I want to take a little bit of a longer view in, in just a second, but let, let's start here. How, how has he been this week? How's his response been to what happened in South Bend Saturday night? Uh, I, I think I've seen at least one sound bite, and this is, this is the thing about social media. You only see a bite. You don't get the, uh, you know the full picture of of how a coach com- comports himself and reacts to to adversity, but the bite that really again got a lot of play around here was we're close, right? We're <laughs> we're not we're not that far off, which is again a familiar refrain from when he was saying the same things uh, during leaner times when he was at OU. Not that there were a lot of them. How has Riley been this week? Just in in your view, uh, not any different than he has been the previous weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. I think he. I think last year he was kind of took a similar tone. Like if I think from his perspective, if he would he would say last year when they lost to Utah, he's like, if we keep fighting, we keep hanging in there, then we'll be there 
in the mix at the end. And, and they were last year. I mean, they're up 17 to three on Utah and yeah. uh, Caleb Williams sort of hurt his hamstring and uh, that kind of ruined their shot in the Pac-12 title game to make the playoff. Um, it's just harder to see this year. I, I think fans have kind of been upset with the press conferences lately just because they get 41 to Colorado. And I asked him after the game, I said, Lincoln, this is the, the defensive personnel is better this year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but some of the same defensive issues pop up. It's not, not all of them, but some of them that you right. saw this year pop up. And, yeah. um, he said it's not the same issues. Like he doesn't agree with, you know, the assumption that it's the same issues. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of the fans here clicked on, uh, like hung on to like the line where he said, not to the trained eye, not to a coach. And they've been, they've been, they've been hanging on that. Mm-hmm. And a little phrase ever since and the, and the trained eyes and stuff like that. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it, it is some of the same issues. Um, you know, they're not, they tackled well against Notre Dame, but Notre Dame doesn't have a good offense. We'll see how they tackle against Washington and, and, and Oregon. Sure. Right. Um, but it, it's some of the same, like, Maybe it's not like, okay, they're getting physically beat up like they were last year, but it's like the same kind of like lack of focus in the fourth quarter where they have a 21 point lead and then all of a sudden it becomes seven points because the defense kind of lets up a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did that in the Cotton Bowl and it really, really hurt, like, of cost them the game. Um, was they just let go of the rope at the end of the game. And um, so I, I think um, he's he's been kind of not defiant, but he's been very confident. Um, and then last week when he was very confident and kind of doubling down, tripling down on his support of Alex Grinch and the defense being improved this year. And um, he kind of took, struck that same tone after the loss to Notre, to Notre Dame when he was mm-hmm. talking about um, if they fight and they put the work in, they're going to be where they want to be. The opportunity still out there for them at the end. And he mentioned that there's only been like one year where he wasn't in the conference title game that, that last year. At, Oklahoma, and he said, even then, we're only one play away. Um, so, you know, he still has his confidence. Um, I think some of the fan base, not not all of it. Uh, there's a segment of it that's wondering why he's so confident when the on-field product doesn't look that great. Yeah. Um, so, um, that's how it's kind of been uh, this week. He he hasn't lost his confidence, but we'll see if it kind of people want to see that confidence translate to on-field. Mm-hmm improvement sure what are your general impressions of him do you i i found him i i'll say if i'm going to ask you that i I guess it's fair that i offer up you know mine when he was here i i actually thought i actually got along with him fine Mm. uh i i thought he presented himself well at press conferences um he was more more or less fair with the media did some things that i disagreed with that popped up again again Mm -hmm. this year with the the case involving the uh, the brief suspension of one of the beat writers out there um obviously took some things personally that he shouldn't have. And yet at the same time, I, I liked his answers when asked questions, um, gave us more or less enough time. I thought comparatively speaking, gave us a decent number of, of, of players and staff members and seemed to have a grasp of, of what the job entailed when it came to boosters and donors and, and, mm-hmm. you know, shaking the right hands, right. Slapping the right backs, that, that kind of thing. Your sense of how he's done in that regard at USC. Yeah, I think. Media wise, coming in, I think he's been, he was a little more guarded when he came in here. It's different. Obviously, in Oklahoma, he started over there as an offensive coordinator and then became the head coach. And this one is well established and kind of, you know, was a big, high profile hire. Um, so, obviously, I think, and you probably saw this, like uh, when he became head coach, a little more guarded and not like maybe not building like those one on one relationships with the media and media members specifically, um, maybe a little bit more closed off. Uh, in that regard, uh, but I mean, he's been good to deal with. I haven't had any issues with, you know, stuff over here. It's he's given us freshmen this year. I know that was a big, uh, a big thing at Oklahoma, but it, it really was. <laughs> and lot, I know it's Los Angeles, so it's different. But you know, a lot of the freshmen have talked this year, and I know um, that was, a, like I said, that was a big thing. We've had yeah. Zachariah Branch, you know, Tackett Curtis, almost all the freshmen have. All the freshmen that I've played have pretty much talked um, and spoken to the media uh, this year when we still get Caleb every Wednesday. And um, I, I think the different, 
obviously we knew it was going to be different at U- as a, as a beat at USC. We knew it was going to be different with Lincoln just because in 2018, Clay Helton, I was watching practice all of practice on Tuesday, and Wednesday, and so like I, um, 2019, we saw all of training camp, and uh, 2021, I think we saw all of practice as well. You know, mm-hmm. We couldn't report on all of it, but we, we got to watch and observe. Wow. And I, just, I just knew whoever the new head coach was going to be, Lincoln Riley or anyone else. I just knew yeah. that, that wasn't going to be the case. Right, right. We had so much access. It was like, and I know. Uh, I think my first year at USC, we talked to Clay Helton on. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday after the game, and Sunday. And just like it was five days a week, you're, you're talking to the head coach. I just knew, like, right now we get Lincoln on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and then he does yeah. his his radio show on on uh, Monday. But I just knew, like, whoever the head, whoever the next head coach is, the, yeah. the media is not going to be that way. But uh, you know, and boosters wise, I think he's he's done a good job. He's gone to those NIL events and those collective events and he's been there and been kind of active and uh, very involved um, Mm -hmm. in that stuff with those donors. Yeah. Here's how I put it, Antonio is, and this is, we we actually did a reaction to the, uh, when, when he handed or when USC, I don't know if he, if it ever came from him or or the university, uh, the the suspension of what Luca, right. Mm -hmm. The reporter got into some, uh, Reported something that they felt he shouldn't have. All and the re, it was a reaction, right? Suspension, not a discussion. Thought I thought it warranted a discussion, not a suspension. And it reminded me of of Riley coming down on the OU Daily, the student paper here at Norman, for reporting that Caleb Williams was getting all the first team practice reps <laughs> after what he did against Texas two years ago, when everyone figured that was going to be the case anyway. Mm-hmm. I I would say that just that those two episodes sum up maybe my view of, of Riley's biggest fault. And that is he sort of gets in his own way uh, when he doesn't need to. And, and it, it, it sort of maybe translates to maybe sound bites from after games when he, when it's okay to recognize what's obvious, if the defense has, you know, holes full of it, say as much and say what we're going to try to fix them or fill them. Uh, If there was a play or a player that did something off that, that put the team in a bad spot, say as much, you you can still acknowledge without throwing a kid or a coach under the bus. It's okay to do that as opposed to we're close or we're almost there, or you just don't get it or you don't, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, Is that, is that a fair characterization? He could help himself more, especially for as smart a guy as he is or as sharp as a, as a coach and a guy he comes off as being. Yeah, I think sometimes he's transparent and you kind of get what he's trying to get at. And then there's other times where, like I, like we said earlier, and then doubling down on the defense or doubling down on yeah. kind of the way they're playing and um, stuff like that when it's clear they they aren't playing well or you know it's not all clicking right now. Um, I, I think I think something that's kind of popped up this week again is like the special teams coach, the special teams coordinator thing because. Uh, they gave up, they gave up a big kickoff return for a touchdown on Saturday when mm-hmm. they're trying to close the gap and uh, Notre Dame takes it 99 yards for for a touchdown. And the week before that, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of Oklahoma fans, if they stayed up late, they were watching the USC Arizona game yeah, right. at the end of regulation, and um, yeah. they botched the field goal mm-hmm. that could have closed out the game. They wouldn't have had to go to three overtimes. And then the week before that, they messed up an extra point and uh, against Colorado and. They missed a field goal at the end of the game. Uh, that would have made it a 17-point game with like five minutes left. And so that kind of gave Colorado life. And then you think back to the Cotton Bowl last year, and there's Mario Williams dropping the kickoff return at the one-yard line, which pretty much allowed Tulane to to get back in that game and be in position to win it and come back from 15 points down with four and a half minutes left. Um, so th- there's these gaps that you see. And um, it's just stuff like that, attention to detail. and um, where you know he wants to double down on you know saying they're an improved special teams unit and um it's just like okay well zachariah branch makes the return team better Uh, Mm um he's an electric player and a really dynamic return man and receiver Mm -hmm. um so they are better the 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 punting is better um but but there's still issues (laughs) and so yeah he said said yesterday it's like their special team is much improved well yeah um, in some spots it is, but there's still like major things that are happening <laughs> that are bad. Um, yeah. So um, it's just stuff like that, like you said, that um, maybe where he doesn't help himself sometimes. And I know, like, I remember 
uh, sitting next to David Ubbin, my colleague at Colorado. And he was like, Lincoln's, I think they were, he had won like 15 of the first 18 games or whatever. And, uh, you know, he was, he just turned five, he just became five and zero after the beat Colorado. And it's, mm -hmm. um, the fan base is mad because Alex Grinch is still there. <laughs> the defense yeah. hasn't, hasn't improved. Right. Like, it's like, what other, like, how often do you really see that to where it's, you know, somebody might be, uh, 16 and three in their first 19 games. And then, um, from a program that was four and eight when he took over. Yeah. Yeah. And some people are still upset and like really angry about a decision he made. Um, yeah. No. So. And yeah. And to, to flip that over, I, it was, it was sort of startling to see a, a state of the art offense that he ran at Oklahoma with the quarterbacks who were winning Heisman trophies and being so for, for it to be so blatantly obvious of what was keeping the program from advancing, you know, one two rungs higher nationally was was the defense and if it, it if it if, if that was obvious to either media or fans how could it not be to the guy who's you know in charge of the program and i i suppose there's some of that with with since it's still alex grinch running the defense and it's still again some of the same problems that are still limiting and holding back this this you know otherworldly quarterback running the state-of-the-art offense uh people land on that it's like you should, Dude, I mean, you got to see this, uh, you know, man up and do something about it. It's easy yeah. for it's easy to go there, but at the same time, the pic if the picture's there, it gives you the excuse to go there. If that makes any sense. Yeah, to be fair to Lincoln and Alex Grinch, USC's defense in twenty twenty one, the year before they got there, was terrible. It was mm -hmm. probably the worst, the worst in school history. So I kind of give them a pass for last year with the defense being bad. Obviously, the tackling is inexcusable that they showed at the end of the year in the Pac twelve title game and the Cotton Bowl. But the personnel really wasn't there. USC's recruiting classes, the first, the four years before Lincoln got there, were really subpar and just yeah. more up to the standard of what the program had been used to. Um, even under Sarkeesian or Lane Kiffin or anything, like the the recruiting on defense had just really dropped. And um, in twenty twenty one, it was probably the worst defense in school history. They're given a ton of points, and I think they were in the one twenties in yards per play allowed. Um, I never expected the defense to be good in year one, um, no matter who was taking over. I thought that was going to be a years long rebuild. Yeah, uh, but the personnel is better this year. The defense, the defensive line personnel is better. Um, they've recruited well in the secondary. That's like the one, one of the few areas, along with like quarterback and receiver, that USC's recruited well at over the past few years. Mm -hmm. um, Linebacker still kind of, you know, leaves a lot to be desired, but. The defensive personnel, I think, there's talent there this year that wasn't there last year, and um, they still have issues. I know they get 48 points on Saturday. A lot of that was the offense, um, but the, the two weeks before that, they still get 41 in consecutive games. Mm -hmm. So it really hasn't improved to where people want, where the fans want to see it improve, and yeah, obviously they they feel like okay. The fans feel like, okay, we have Caleb Williams on our side. We have a shot in every game. And then um, now it's it's one thing if you don't win a national title with him or something, but they'll probably feel another way if you end up like in the Holiday Bowl or the Alamo Bowl, where you're not even like yeah. in the New Year's Six Bowl or like, yeah. in the conversation for the Pac-12 title. I think that that hits a little different. Yeah, for sure. How do you like covering Caleb? Uh, he's, he's good to cover. I mean, he talks to us every week. Uh, He's, I think he's very measured and he kind of handles himself like a, like a pro already mm -hmm. in, in that regard and how he goes about things. He's really exciting to watch. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, um, he's not going to go out of his way to kind of make any sound bites or anything or say anything right. controversial. Um, so I think, you know, he's been coached up well to do that stuff. And, uh, obviously it's just different because, um, so much NIL stuff and so much attention. <laughs> they, yeah. You know, there, there's stuff he's doing, like the GQ article and stuff that, you know, it's, you haven't really seen that from any other quarterbacks at USC before um, to where they're getting so much attention and things like that. Well, not since I've been on the beat. I mean, liner back in the day probably was, but I mean, um, so just unusual in that regard, just because he does so much off the field too. 
there's a there's a groundswell of, of there's already a groundswell in terms of how he'll position himself right for for being the first pick in the in the next NFL draft assuming that, that he goes there there's not a scenario Antonio in your mind where he comes comes back and takes you know whatever NIL money he's getting and puts puts that off another year is that's that's not possible right I mean that's yeah Carl Williams is dead you know said that in that GQ article maybe he'll come back I just yeah. have a hard time really hard time believing it um just because you might make a good amount of money us at usc next year but it's a race to that second contract in the nfl and getting paid you know 300 million dollars or whatever the quarterbacks are going for these days whatever patrick mahomes or josh allen's making to be the highest paid player in the nfl basically um so if you do that well you're kind of delaying that for a year and uh, i just think that um, that wouldn't make a ton of sense um, financially. Um, right. Just to stay one year at USC and make ten million dollars or whatever, whatever it is they might make. Um, so I think, you know, even though it's out there, I just have a really, really hard time believing that's a possibility. So if he's gone, the defense still needs repairs. The offensive line still needs repairs. Recruiting's good, to, to use your word, but maybe not great. You convinced that that Riley's up to this? If if this becomes a little bit of a longer slog than he anticipated, not to mention I, the fact that they're going to the Big Ten. Yeah, I think that's the thing that's kind of interesting to everybody because he hasn't really been in that position before, where it's like, okay, here's this big rebuild project. It's taking. Yeah. Last year was expected to be that, um, but they're much better than I thought, and a lot of people expected. Um, I certainly didn't expect them to go eleven and one in the regular season last year. Right. Um, and I think that got a lot of people's expectations up for this year. And, uh, but people, I thought when USC fired Clay Hilton, I was like, okay, this is going to be a multi year rebuild. And whoever steps in, it's going to take them two or three years to really get this thing going. Um, so if you would ask, I think somebody asked me in a mailbag or something back in like December 2021, like, when would I predict USC to go to the, to win the back 12? And I said, 2024. Like, that's, three years and you know uh he'll have a time to get the roster down the defense better and all that stuff i I like at the time i didn't know what the one year trans what the immediate transfer thing yeah would bring in terms of roster movement and he just completely overhauled the roster he brought in like 30 new players last year not dion level but at the time it was huge um so um i didn't expect that and i think Obviously, that allowed him to be a lot better in year one than most people thought. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious to see how it goes next year just because um, this rust, like the offensive line needs help. Um, like I said, the defense does to get better. Will will Alex Grinch be the defense coordinator next year or will it be somebody else? And and going to the Big Ten just makes it harder. I know the Pac-12 is great um, this year, but... Now you're in a league with Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, uh, Washington, and Oregon. There's USC was really good last year, but they were also fortunate that they missed Oregon and right. Washington on the schedule. Now you're going to have to play those teams, one of those teams every year. Uh, they have to play UCLA too, but um, this is schedule's going to get harder. And um, you, you know, there might not be any Caleb. And you just think of the schedule next year, like they open with LSU in Las mm -hmm. Vegas, and you still have Notre Dame. And then you have a, uh, a trip to Michigan, home game to Penn State. Um, so it's a really difficult schedule. Mm -hmm. and you're going to be breaking in a, a new quarterback, uh, whether it's Malachi Nelson or Miller Moss or a transfer. Um, yeah. So, and you have these questions elsewhere on the roster. Um, they'll, they'll they'll address some of them in the transfer portal, I imagine, and, yeah. and recruiting. Um, but there's just a lot of questions, and I think he hasn't really been in a situation like this um before and i think people are really interested to see how he responds how he responds to it yeah let's let's close here if if we learned when riley left ou for usc that that perhaps he wasn't as comfortable as he let on and you can parse that however you want with leaving the big 12 for the sec oklahoma leaving for the sec maybe putting himself in a more advantageous position at usc at the time this is before we knew what was coming for usc curious to know how convinced you are that he's comfortable with SC's move to the Big Ten. He he seems like he's comfortable with it from just from yeah. you know, hearing everything he said so far. I mean, it's one of the two premier conferences in the sport. So, um, I mean, I don't 
obviously it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be harder. Um, but I think that's where any coach would want to be uh, right now in the SEC or in the Big Ten. Um, just because everything else is kind of like second fiddle to those two leagues. Um, but it, but it is going to be more difficult. And there's going to be – that's why I'm interested in watching like Wisconsin and Purdue this year because they, they don't run the same offense as Lincoln, but it's air raid teams. I'm kind of interested to see how they translate to the Big Ten because um, there's going to be a lot of games, a lot of teams like Notre Dame in the Big Ten. And we just – you know, we saw they gave USC a problem uh, this past weekend, so I'm kind of curious to see – how that'll translate and how that'll respond and how they'll respond uh, yeah. once they leave. Yeah. Uh, not a matter of if, but when and where in terms of Riley to the NFL, would you, would you track with that thought uh, that, that, he's, that he's doing it? You just don't know when and, and with what organization or I think that's, you don't want to, you don't want to go there. I, I think that's most of the thoughts. So like if there's a successful USC coach, I think that's the lot with them most of the time. Uh, Obviously, that was a thought with Lincoln at Oklahoma, so I don't think it's really changed much. Yeah, yeah. The assu- assumption is the NFL, and uh, yeah, we'll see when and if you know when and if that happens, uh, kind of what direction they go in. But I mean, I mean, you start to hear it from the fan base like this week, like is he going to the pros? Like, uh, <laughs> and they start to look for the signs, like. A new AD who he hasn't worked for, moving to a bigger conference, a, a better conference, no Caleb next year. Like some are obviously worried about the recruiting. And sometimes you see that with a coach, like to where recruiting isn't as great. Like Jimbo Fisher yeah. at Florida State when he left, like a recruiting right. just fell off. USC's recruiting hasn't fallen off, uh, but it's not as good as the fans like want it to be. So like, what about recruiting? Like, look at this. Like, they're, so they're kind of like looking for the signs. And like, um, so it's just interesting, I think. I think that's the assumption at some point he will leave for the NFL. I don't know when. So yeah. who knows? It'll be uh, interesting to kind of find out when when and if that does happen. Yeah. Interesting is a word to, to, to describe Lincoln Riley, if nothing else. That's for sure. We found out in Oklahoma, Antonio Morales of The Athletic, finding that out. He covers the Trojans for The Athletic. He's been my guest on this week's episode of Mind Games. One of these days, I might try to climb back into Lincoln's head. For now, Antonio will do. We thank you very much for coming on with us. Uh, Mr. Morales, appreciate your time and your insight into the Trojans. We invite you to to tune in again next week for another episode on the Sellout Crowd Network. Download, like, subscribe, do all the things the kids do on YouTube, Apple, Amazon, and Spotify. Thanks to Jacqueline Musgrove, my producer, Michael Lane, our creative director. Check us out on selloutcrowd.com. In the meantime, for the latest written uh, audio and visual content, we'll provide as much as you want to uh, digest. We thank you for doing so, and we wish everyone a pleasant week.